Good. Can you? I can be heard. This is, this is the obligatory stress test uh, at the start of every major civic event. Welcome to the University of Bristol. This is the ninth annual Mirror State of the City Address, and the university has had the honor of hosting all but last year's event, and isn't it fantastic uh, to be back uh, in person? This year, the lecture and panel are again part of the biannual Festival of the Future City. And there have been some fantastic and thought-provoking sessions today and more, much more uh, tomorrow. 2021 uh, festival scenes, or, uh, themes include social justice, inclusive and sustainable cities, urban and planetary health, and digital futures. Uh, and as you know, these themes address the major challenges facing humanity and facing our planet. They're also at the heart, uh, I should say, of the university's research agenda. Uh, and as a global civic university, we want to show how global challenges are often most powerfully addressed through co-creation in the local context. And, it, and it's this principle that underpins our civic mission and in turn informs our approach to collaboration with you, with our local partners and communities. With its aim of being the largest public debate about the future of cities, we're delighted again to be, or to be part of this year's festival. If you're unable to attend all of the events or any of the events in person, much of the program can be viewed online uh, free via the Bristol Ideas website and YouTube channel. And the University of Bristol and Bristol Ideas also partner on a wide variety of other events throughout the year. And you can uh, get details of these events on our, on our website, bristol.ac.uk backslash events. To formally commence uh, tonight's proceedings, we'll now be treated to a performance by Caleb Parkin, Bristol's third city poet. Caleb is well known to many of you. He's a poet, facilitator, and filmmaker with a passion for inclusive environmentalism, well-being, arts, culture, and heritage, and LGBT plus pride. His poems have been published widely, including in the Poetry Review, The Rialto, Butcher's Dog, Under the Radar, and Bristol 24-7. So I hope you enjoy the rest of tonight's events, and I'd like to extend a thank you to all of our speakers and panelists in advance for their contributions. So please welcome Caleb Parkin. Okay, Ooh, is that working? Yes, I thought I was gonna have to do a bit of Brian Blessed belting it out there, but no. Hello, uh, thanks very much for having me here tonight. Um, so when I was doing my initial teacher training, and that's as far as I got, by the way, with my teacher training, apart from a term, um, there was a trainer called Sharon, and she would sometimes start a session by saying, would you like to hear a story? Of course she would. And so ahead of COP26, the climate conference uh, next month, I was thinking about fables, these stories often involving animals with a clear moral. The, uh, the most famous one is probably the tortoise and the hare slow and steady wins the race. Mary Oliver, at the end of her poem, uh, Wild Geese, much beloved poem, refers to the family of things. And I think of fables being about the family of things and their being in dialogue. So poems can be stories, stories can be poems, and so that's where I've gone with this. And I guess by deconstructing the fable a little, I'm thinking about scale and perspective and the stories we tell and hear. So, would you like to hear a story? Of course you would. The egret and the estuary, a fubble ahead of COP26. This is a befuddled fable, a de-fable, a fumbled fable. It's a fubble, that's it. A new thing, and this one begins, once upon a galaxy there was a solar system. So that feels overwhelming. So instead, it starts, once upon a solar system, there was a planet called Earth, and Earth was the third child of the sun, and they had a pretty special relationship. But maybe that's a bit big too. So let's try, 
Once upon an earth, there was an ocean, and it was the most gorgeous of oceans, sparkling as the eye of someone you really fancy. And yes, Earth really fancied ocean and said, let's get closer. Hang on, though. Where's that headed? Not quite the vibe we're after, is it? Let's zoom in. Once upon a beach, there was a grain of sand. Too far. Too much. Right. Once upon an estuary, there lived a little egret. How's that? You know, egrets, a bit like herons, wading birds, spend their days dipping their beaks in mud, strutting shallows. And they're pretty, these little egrets, and pretty new in many places too, migrating from further afield. Now summers are more egret appealing, but that's probably by the by. This egret is gorgeous, pristine, envied by gulls, worshipped by moorhens, revered and feared by fishes the length of the estuary shore. Estuary, which, interrupting Egret's narrative puff, says, are you aware of my latest policy regarding undertoes and sprat quotas? I'm cascading this info on behalf of the president of tides and CEO of water, AKA the moon and ocean. The Egret ignored Estuary and jutted its claws, eyes lasered on glimmering dinners. I'm busy, said Egret. Can't you see how the fishes are gleaming in my shadow? And I'm hungry, always hungry. I'll listen to your policies when I'm full. So Estuary went <laughs> with a gust of breeze and tutted by slapping some weed against a tongue of driftwood. Egret went on feeding, warded off gulls from his patch. The fish in the shallows, a shimmer in his eye, and he dined and waded and dined. Next day, Estuary, dressed in its most imposing power suit gray with pinstripe waves, tapped Egret on the beak and said, Egret, the regulations have changed again. I'm cascading this new information on behalf of the boss now. She emailed it via volcanic eruption. Says all employees need to attend a training facilitated by their local Estuary, and that is me, an Egret with a dismissive flick of his wing, said, Estuary, I'm still busy, okay? The fish are getting tricksy, spreading out and staying away. I'm putting in longer shifts to keep the gulls and moorhens and my hunger at bay. I'll catch a training another day. So Estuary huffed off with a bluster and a cough of spray and left Egret to stalk and snipe. Until the following week, Estuary piped up again with a force four rasp like they smoked 40 a day. Egret, you need to listen now. This comes right from the top, the boss, the full committee. We need to talk. We have to, we have to talk. But Egret's dark pebble eyes flitted in his own reflection as he snippily squawked. Can't you see I have no time for this estuary? The fish are hidden, are thinning. My claws are so tired and my beak is open, but empty. The gulls are encroaching, the moorhens emboldened and picking at my feathers. I don't have time, estuary, for your lectures, your figures, your doom-laden conjectures. I am tired, estuary, and I am busy. So estuary showed its dismay by edging the tide out a smidge lower than usual, the mud in an arc of a frown. In the week after this, Estuary watched as Egret squabbled and scrabbled, waded and wanted, hungry and angry. Estuary met with ocean and the moon and the boss, and they looked at the stats of Egret and the others in the avian division, the marine vertebrate teams. They looked at the whole organizational diagram, creaking like a lightning-struck tree. And if they had heads, they'd have scratched them. And the moral of this story is, is somewhere, somewhere in the gap between Egret and Estuary. It is somewhere in the meeting Estuary had with Ocean, who spoke with the boss, the boss the third child called Earth, who the sun loved and loves still. And Earth gazes now 
across the harsh face of Mercury, the cold glare of Venus. And the sun sighs back, a flare piercing the dark. Thank you. close the door and not have to worry about anyone else. I'm comfortable, I've got everything that I need around me. A peaceful environment, somewhere where I can just relax, you know what I mean? You can just be yourself and there's no pressure to be anyone or anything else. A place where you can be loved and supported. A place of comfort, a place where you can relax. A place of like warmth and safety and security. Having sort of like a, a support network around you. Somewhere that I can feel secure and safe. So I live with my mum, my dad and my daughter, but there's not actually a lot, a lot of space for my daughter. Yeah, it's difficult. It'd be nice to have my own key so I can go home when I want. So this is my mum's back garden and we are creating a home. I never thought the council could find me a home in a space like this. And it's nice to know that you have people around you to support you. And it just feels so important because I'm involved. Like, it's not just down to the builders, it's down to us as well. And I like to meet the crew as well, which is quite cool. Like, I get to learn some new skills. Yeah, make new friends, I guess. I'm really excited to paint and decorate my daughter's room with her. Yeah, I'm just excited for the space. And we'll be able to have people around. It's more independence, more freedom, and more time to spend time with my daughter. changed me a lot since I've been here because I was really down in the dumps. There was nothing really going on, do you know what I mean, now? Now living in one of the best places to live in. Because everyone's so friendly. I just love it because wherever you go, they'll talk to you from the bottom to the top. They all speak to you and make you uh, welcome, you know. Lots of support and all the carers are so lovely. Nice neighbours as well. Lovely neighbours. They've got they have got some lovely gardens. Really nice. Yeah. I spend hours at the window watching the squirrels. <laughs> My daughters have said to me, you should have done this years ago, Mum. Buying my first home uh, meant a lot to me. I've saved for many years to be able to buy it. Um, and I just felt a great sense of pride when I finally got, got that key and stepped over the threshold. We were living with parents in order to save up the deposit. Um, we were living in Western Supermare, so we've moved to Bristol to have a bit more of the city life. Um, so we feel really lucky that we're able to buy a house so close to the city centre. Um, buying a new build as well, you basically buy a blank canvas so you can do with it whatever you want. There's a lot of stability and security and just living somewhere where you feel safe and look forward to coming home to at the end of the day. When you hit rock bottom, that's where I was. A lot of things went wrong from finance to housing. Eventually we end up in a cramp accommodation, myself and my children, and we start to start from scratch. We've lost out on a lot of things, like having friends over or parties or my children having their own space, especially the young one, my daughter. And then I did my application through Home Choice a few times. We got the keys, it was amazing. It was really, really nice and we loved it immediately. It's spacious, it's bigger. So now everybody's just like, have their little room, have their time, and we come downstairs, we'll watch something or we'll eat together, you know? And then you have that me time. But we didn't have that before. It's a little bit more privacy and it, it's really important. My old place was a bit challenging to say the least most nights you'd hear some shouting or some wall banging or someone kicking the doors things like that but compared to what i have now look at it <laughs> surrounded by trees the sun's shining through like it's pretty amazing you know and i feel like this place has just done such a good job of making me feel like you have support around you sometimes an activity or People are having food nights and the people here are just so nice. Like, you feel like you're being welcomed with open arms every time you see them. Each, each person that I've met has helped me come out of my shell a little bit more.
well, <laughs> I think mainly for me it means smiling, like being able to be in your own space and being able to be uh, however weird and however happy you feel like you want to be. <laughs> Good evening. Right, I'm hoping it's working now. So my name is Alice and I'm the Youth Mayor of Bristol. And thank you so much for inviting me here tonight to speak at this event and on this topic of how do we create an open and tolerant and inclusive city. And I want to speak on that theme specifically from the perspective of young people. And that sounds a little bit like I'm going to give you a TED talk and it probably looks a little bit like I am. Now I have this beautiful Britney mic due to the lectern not working. But I'm going to try and give you a perspective of young people on this issue. So, and it is so lovely to be standing at an in-person event. And while the watershed was lovely last year, it's lovely to be looking at everyone's faces and not just be looking straight down a camera. And as you can imagine, being elected in February 2020, I haven't had the opportunity to do many of these events. So firstly, I thought it would be a good idea just to give you a short introduction on what the Youth Council actually is. So we are a group of elected young people with co-opted members from equalities groups who work to represent the young people of Bristol. So the five equalities groups that we are representing are Young Carers, Children in Care Council, Listening Partnership, Freedom Youth and Unity Youth Forum. And these groups are included and were identified by the Youth Council many years ago to ensure that the voice of the Youth Council is as representative as possible. And we have definitely learned a lot from them and their ideas. So while I believe that this event is a positive one and should be used to celebrate and challenge work currently going on in Bristol, it would be irresponsible of me not to acknowledge the impact that COVID has had on young, and recent political events have had on young people. Young people have been found to be one of the most affected groups by COVID-19. Our education was massively disrupted and we were unable to socialise for, for months on end and this was really tricky for a lot of young people. This impact is still being felt and we are still working to catch up on work and our exams still aren't looking the same. The last undisrupted year for those who were in year 11 was when they were in year 8. And I think that's something really important to remember when we're expecting these young people to be taking exams. The report which we have written on this is both harrowing but shows the resilience of young people and I would definitely recommend reading it. However, perhaps more positively, young people have also been at the heart of a lot of social action, especially in Bristol in the last two years. Whether that be from Black Lives Matter protests to Youth Strike for Climate, or when we took to an online protest to protest our grades in 2020. Young people are constantly making their voices heard. And to the adults in power, I would say listen. But not only listen, I would say engage. Engage with these young people on what they're saying and ensure that you really are listening to what they're saying and not just taking it. But I would also say to the young people that are campaigning to engage with the elected officials, to engage with everyone and to go beyond just putting your voice to a, perhaps a social media campaign. And sometimes, and I have learned as youth mayor, the back end is a bit bureaucratic and it takes a long time. But I think it's a mark of a good activist and those I've seen do so well are the people who engage the whole way through. And I think that is how we can begin to build bridges and build towards a more inclusive future, one where we can have an open dialogue. And it would be remiss of me, especially as a young woman, not to speak about the tragic death of Sarah Everard and those countless women who have been killed since. This has had a large impact on young people, and especially young, people's, young women's views on safety. This is a conversation that isn't over and it won't be until there are clear and public pledges from police forces up and down the country on training and security checks that they will be introducing, especially for young girls. That bridge of trust has been broken and I hope it has not been irrevocably broken. This is a time for those with privilege to reflect on it and work to ensure that everyone can feel safe, especially when coming home. But now for something perhaps more positive some direct action from the Youth Council. What have we been doing for the last two years and what have we been doing as a group for the time we've existed? 
Despite the pandemic, the Youth Council has still been doing some, I would say, amazing work, maybe I'm biased. We have campaigned on four key campaign groups, Equal Bristol focusing on equalities issues, supported mental wellbeing, environment and transport, and Youth Voice. As normal, most of the work that goes on is behind the scenes. A lot of people won't see it. We collated evidence and wrote a report on the impact of COVID on young people, which I've already mentioned, and it's been sent out to all the youth work practitioners in Bristol. Additionally, we surveyed over 1,300 young people on walking and cycling, which I'm fairly sure is more responses than most of the council surveys get, so we were quite proud of that. And this research was conducted and written by John Wayman, our other youth mayor, who has now gone off to university. And these, this report is also available on our website. We have also launched and are now running the International Youth Mayors Association, which was founded in lockdown and is a flagship group of approximately 50 youth mayors from, at the moment, eight countries, but we're always expanding. And we come together once a month to talk and share best practice and campaign together. We also sit on countless boards and have worked with elected and non-elected officials alike. And we're working with the Police and Crime Commissioner on the young people's relationships with police. And perhaps this leads me to the most asked question of young people in politics. Are you being listened to or are you a tick box exercise? And I can confidently say that in terms of the Youth Council, I don't think we are. And our engagement with the council is amazing. And every time I say that Marvin has genuinely been amazing, people kind of look at me like, are you being paid to say that? Or when I say, you know, we work with the cabinet and they really listen to us, they're like, is, is that true? But I can genuinely say, have not been paid, um, that we need more leaders like Marvin, like Asha, like the entire cabinet, because they have never once tried to force feed me or a youth councillor an opinion. They have always sat with us and we've discussed things openly and tackled the hardest issues. And I know from speaking to young people up and down the country that, unfortunately, this isn't always like this. We've had them support every crazy idea that we've had. And even when I told Marvin the other day that I needed an Instagram account and that the council IT department were being too slow, he did send an email, and now we have an Instagram account. So, you know, it's going well. <laughs> so... And I know, I know this is not the case, and that young people's voices need to be listened to in, in all walks of life and respected. And I would say to anyone wanting to engage with young people before asking young, for young people's voices on projects, ask why. Why are you asking them to be a part of this? Ask how are you going to use their voice and how will you give feedback to them? How will their time be used well? How will you make their time worthwhile? Why are you going to meet? Where are you going to meet? Too often, adults make young people come to them, but adults have cars and incomes and jobs, and they have time. So why can't you go to the young people instead? Come to young people and make their voices heard. Go to the young people. Just don't rely on them coming to you. And whatever you are doing, there will be a need for your young person's voice, and it is your duty to find it, because you are building our city. I sit on boards where I can guarantee you at least some of them will very probably be dead before the project we're talking about actually comes to fruition. And that is the cold, hard truth of it. And I think I won't be. The young people of Bristol will not be, and it is our city that you are building right now. So it's time that people in the city start seeking out Youth Voice because I guarantee you, whatever project you are doing, there will be a group of young people with expertise, power and passion, and they will be ready to help. But the question is, are you ready to ask? Thank you. I was going to get an introduction. <laughs> so do it yourself. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just thank you uh, to Alice and, and, and Caleb for uh, getting us off to um, an amazing start. Our city poets have been an incredible part, uh, you know, of our city journey. When we were recruiting, uh, we described the positions uh, as like journalists are there to capture the facts and poets are there to capture the soul you know, of Bristol. Uh, and then we have our um, incredible uh, youth mayor Alice. And I will say, it's, she's not just had an impact within Bristol, 
but in reaching out to youth mayors across Europe, through Euro cities, across the UK, and even into the United States, and now through the Commonwealth Local Government Forum as well, has begun to really rally and organize the voice of young people in politics around the world, and that is coming out of Bristol, and it's been um, absolutely um, something um, amazing. I do just need to start, uh, though, just by just asking us to give some time uh, just a thought about what life can be like for some people in Bristol. Last week, you know, we had a tragedy in Bristol of a young man that killed on our streets. And first off, I want to extend my respects uh, to his family. And I also think it's important from the conversations I've had to share with you that the messages I received uh, on the morning after uh, the young man's passing were of people telling me that he was a good young man uh, he was vulnerable and he needed, uh, he needed support. And it's very important that whatever headlines fly around, we remember that there are young people um, out there uh, like that. I had actually met him myself. He was over at Empire Fighting Chance and I'd invited him down. I'd given him my business card and invited him down for a cup of tea. And it's a real sadness for me that we never had that cup of tea and we never will get to have that uh, cup of tea. But his tragic death should remind us all that we have very different experiences of Bristol and we must be respectful of those differences if we are serious about building um, an inclusive city. I do just have to give some thanks now. Um, and first, I want to thank Hugh Brady, who I've lost sight of. Uh, but uh, Hugh, thank you again for hosting uh, the annual State of the City Address. And just to, for all of you who don't know, Hugh is going to move on to a new chapter in life. And we wish you all the best, Hugh, as you move off to be the VC of Imperial College London. And just to say that the work you've done to, to take Bristol on a journey to becoming a civic university and to deliver the new Temple Quarter campus that you'll see going up behind the train station will leave a real legacy um, in Bristol. I also want to extend my thanks to Andrew Kelly. And Andrew's been the chief executive of Festival of Ideas now. Uh, now it's called Bristol Ideas for 29 years. And he's contributed hugely to Bristol's cultural life um, and the quality of our public discourse. Make it, and He's helped to make Bristol better, raising our profile on the national and the international stage. And I also uh, need to thank you, Bristol, the city. This is my first state of the city since being re-elected. And I absolutely recognize the mayoral position is not mine. It's loaned to me by you. And I thank you for entrusting it into my care again. So we're 18 months now on from the first uh, COVID lockdown. From the beginning, we explained we were not just dealing with the virus itself, but the consequences of the actions needed to stem the spread of the virus. We have seen the impact, death and bereavement, the disruption to education, loneliness, hunger, mental health, domestic violence, job losses. And at the same time, our underlying inequalities have been compounded as it's the most marginalized who have been hit first and hardest and then found themselves least well placed to benefit from any recovery. And we're gonna be living with the effects of the pandemic for decades, or maybe I should say for generations. That makes it all the more important that we don't allow the pain to be for nothing. And I think there are three interdependent lessons we have the opportunity to learn if we choose to. The first reinforces points I shared in my address last year, where I cited Richard Horton from The Lancet. And he argued we aren't suffering merely from a pandemic, but what he called a syndemic, in which two categories of disease are interacting, the communicable disease, COVID-19, and the non-communicable diseases that cluster around poverty and inequality. And this is what he said, that the most important consequence of seeing COVID-19 as a syndemic is to underline its social origins. The vulnerability of older citizens, black, Asian and minority ethnic communities and key workers who are commonly poorly paid with fewer welfare protections points to a truth so far barely acknowledged. 
then unless governments devise policies and programs that reverse profound disparities, our societies will never be truly COVID secure. The economic crisis, and he goes on to say, the economic crisis that is advancing towards us will not be solved by a drug or a vaccine. Nothing less than national revival is needed. Approaching COVID-19 as a syndemic will invite a larger vision, one encompassing education, employment, housing, food, and environment. And we, these are my words now, not his, we must have that broader vision. If we don't, then we will remain individually and collectively vulnerable to future health shocks with all their consequence. And it's this collective vulnerability that makes tackling social inequality, that takes tackling social inequality beyond an issue of mere social justice and makes it an issue of national security. And in many ways, we can learn from Bristol's past on this front. In 1832, cholera killed 584 Bristolians from a population of just 96,000. And it's the poorest who were hit first and hardest. The impact exacerbated by overcrowded and unsanitary conditions in slums and workhouses. We came to learn that while the water was the means for transmission, it was the drivers and consequences of poverty that were the accelerants. Both then and today, the resilience and weakness of population health are not just biomedical questions. They are determined by social conditions, themselves the product of political and economic systems. The second lesson is that COVID has humbled us and warned us. It's given us a taste of a natural world reasserting its authority. In the modern era, we've believe that we have the ability to control things, that whatever the crisis, someone somewhere could solve it. So we could decide not to go to war or feed hungry people. We could decide to uh, house the homeless. But we have now tasted living in a world in which no one nowhere could simply make a decision to end the crisis. Until we had the vaccine, the virus stopped us in our tracks. The economy stopped. Elections were postponed. Schools were closed and our flagship public service teetered on the edge of being overwhelmed. We do now have the vaccine and with it, the hope that eventually we'll be able to live with COVID. So now we need to apply that experience of the loss of control to the urgency we bring to the climate emergency. If we pass the tipping point, there will be no hope for recovery. Whether chaos and disorder will feed on each other with rapidly worsening social, economic and political consequences. This threat points to what civil rights activist and Harvard scholar Marshall Gans called the urgency of the now. And this leads to the third insight, which is the importance of cities. Climate change will be won or lost in cities. Cities are home to over half the world's people. They consume over 70% of the world's energy and generate three quarters of global carbon emissions. And yet cities also offer amongst the most sustainable lifestyles. Higher density living can offer lower carbon footprints than sprawling settlements if they are done right. The former mayor of New York, Michael Bloomberg said, most of the things that make cities better, cleaner, healthier, and more economically productive places also reduce carbon emissions. It's a simple statement containing a profound truth that cities are the places where good social policy will lessen the carbon footprints of the greatest number of people and offer the greatest opportunity to minimize the price the planet pays for our growing world population. So we have two major crises, the pandemic and climate, pointing us to the need to expedite delivery of progressive social policy and better, better, better living conditions through cities. So let me take you through some of the ways we are doing that here in our city of Bristol. On climate, we have worked with the city to agree and collectively commit to the One City Climate Strategy and its 2030 carbon neutral and climate resilience targets. We launched our Ecological Emergency Action Plan last month. The plan was led by Avon Wildlife Trust and developed with 36 city organisations. It commits us to 30% of our land being managed for nature a 50% reduction in the use of pesticides, 100% of Bristol's waterways being fit to support healthy wildlife, and a reduction in the use of products that undermine the health of wildlife and wider ecosystems. 
We've invested £42 million on retrofitting council-owned homes. 6,500 homes now having um, had uh, gas boilers replaced. 800 houses and 1,000 flats now having wall insulation, 1,000 new insulated roofs. 2,500 uh, with double glazed replacements. 2,000 have had loft insulation top-ups. Today, 99% of publicly owned homes have double glazing, 98% have insulated cavity walls. We've also planted 70,000 new trees through one tree per child, a program commenced by my predecessor, George Ferguson, and continued by us. More than 9,000 were planted last year, including Bristol's first mini forest in Southmead. A business scheme has, has set a target to plant at least 250,000 trees. All this contributes to our One City Plan goal to double the city's tree canopy by 2046. And we're working with the University of Manchester and the Met Office to understand our city's vulnerability to overheating and how we can protect ourselves from severe heat waves. We've invested 22 million pounds in renewable energy projects and low carbon heat networks. Our district heating network already serves Old Market, Redcliffe and Hartcliffe with Benminster, Temple Quarter and St. Philip's soon to join them. We're installing a, zoo, a, a zero carbon water source heat pump in Castle Park that will heat 1,000 council homes and Castle Park View. And the Benminster Heat Network will source its energy from wastewater. Bristol City Funds has invested £750,000 in Ambition Lance Weston's wind turbine that will provide renewable energy to over 4,000 homes. And our City Leap Partnership promises to transform our city's relationship with energy through a £1 billion package of investment to support system change from the generation and distribution to the storage and smart usage of energy. We're building new flood defences at Avonmouth and Severside, and this is a, an incredible scheme that, that, that combines flood protection with restored natural wetland habitats. We're working with the Environment Agency to deliver flood defences for the whole city centre and the land along the River Avon. We're working with developers to build flood defences into new developments in floodplain areas. And as the country now starts asking government how it will fund its zero carbon climate strategy, we're already working with the World Economic Forum and the UK Cities Climate Investment Commission to connect cities around the world with the public and private finance we need to fund our decarbonisation. The cost of decarbonising Bristol alone is nearly £10 billion, and this is part of a £200 plus billion pound package needed to decarbonise the UK's core cities and London. On housing, we would have built over the last five years some 9,000 new homes by the end of this year, with 12,000 more homes with planning permissions in the pipeline having been delayed by COVID and Brexit. We have 173 homes being built by Bocock on Airport Road. In Loch Lees, we have 185 homes in Bonington Walk and 268 in Romney House being built by our own council-owned company, Gorham Homes. And there's many more. We have at least 1,400 new homes on their way in Hengrove. Not only will around 50% of these be affordable, but they will set a benchmark for off-site modern methods of construction and low carbon development. And now with Bristol Zoo relocating, we have an incredible opportunity to deliver affordable homes in Clifton. We have set ourselves another stretching target of 2,000 homes a year by 2024, and we've set up Project 1000, a council board whose sole aim is to deliver 1,000 affordable homes a year by 2024. On top of that, we've launched an estate renewal program. We're overhauling home choice. We've extended the moratorium on evictions uh, for council tenants. We've joined the advisory board of the Kerslake Commission on ending rough sleeping. And we're on our way to becoming a living rent city. On transport, our flagship policy remains the mass transit system, including the underground. All routes have been identified, linking the north, east, south and airport to the city centre. It will integrate buses and trains and include new stations to form a transformative, low-carbon transport system for Bristol. We, lay the, we laid the foundations with our bus deal, with First Bus. This gives priority to bus travel to support growth in passenger numbers. This is a key step 
in building the business case that will secure the over four billion pound investment needed for the mass transit system. We've introduced bus prioritization, including bus gates on Bristol Bridge and Baldwin Street. This has increased reliability and taken five minutes of bus journeys through the city centre. We delivered new city centre uh, bike lanes, pedestrianised the old city, King Street, Cotton Hill, Princess Street, Princess Victoria Street, and four pilots are now running for school streets, which close roads outside schools at drop-off and pick-up times. We're about to launch a consultation on the introduction of bus prioritisation for the Wells Road to the city centre, over the Downs, and the whole length of the A4018. And we're going to ask you to comment on proposals to remove parking on that route that causes congestion on key routes and the closure of, of Park Street to private cars. This has the potential to reinvent the public realm up to the Triangle and remove rat runs from the Downs. We submitted the full business case for the Clean Air Zone, which will come into force next year. We're negotiating with government now a package of support, including £2 million for clean buses, £720,000 for a new cycle scheme through Old Market, free electric bike loans and cycle training, free bus tickets, discount on car club membership, support to buy electric vehicles, and financial support for business and residents to upgrade from polluting building uh, um, vehicles. We estimate the clean air zone will reduce tra um, traffic traveling into the city center by around 2,000 vehicles per day, while delivering protections for lower paid workers, hospital patients and visitors, and blue badge holders. Over half a century ago, Bristol lost its trams. 20 years ago, lost out on, opportunity, on an opportunity for super trams. This was down to poor leadership, impenetrable uh, council structures, and regional squabbles. We have the opportunity today to get beyond these historical failures and deliver something transformative. We need government funding and support, and we must ensure that the West of England Combined Authority unlocks the investment Bristol and the city region needs. We need substance, not sound bites. On infrastructure, we are fixing the city's aging infrastructure, the chocolate path, key bridges around the city, the sea walls and our road networks, these have been deteriorating for decades with no clear plan for their maintenance. We now have that plan and we have a capital strategy in place. We've also taken on the new infrastructure challenge, such as the arena, where we showed our ability to make the right decision rather than the politically convenient decision. The YTL Bristol Arena is on track to open in early 2024. And the Massive Attack gig showed us that people can and will travel from all parts of the city and beyond to visit. Repurposing the aircraft hangars rather than building a city centre arena from scratch was the right thing to do for the environment. Using the footprint and fabric of the existing building saves 21,400 cubic uh, metres of concrete. The excavation and removal of 28,000 cubic metres of soil and the manufacturing and transportation of 4,000 tonnes of steel. The environmental impact of the Temple Island Arena in development and production in steel alone will be the equivalent of 13,000 flights from Heathrow to New York. Contrast this with YTL's building of one of the most environmentally sustainable arenas in the world with solar panels, reused rainwater, and, sustainable, and, and a sustainable transport plan. And of course, at no cost to the taxpayer. On social care, we've been tackling the crisis that is local government finance. The real cost of COVID and over a decade of austerity mean that the city again faces the challenge of an underfunded council budget. We're working through the numbers right now, but as of today, we have a potential shortfall of 42 million pounds. That may lead to more difficult decisions for the city. Other cities have similar challenges. Projected shortfalls in other core cities range from 15 million pounds to 65 million pounds. COVID has accelerated the already increasing demand for adult social care at the same time as the cost of care services has increased. We've had a 21% increase in mental health demand at a cost of £4 million a year. There's been a £45 per person per week increase in unit costs for learning disability services, resulting in costs increasing by more than £3 million a year. And we're now finding care providers 
unable to recruit workers to fill their positions, contributing to 115 handbacks from domiciliary care providers. Driven by, and this lack of workforce is driven by the availability of higher paid employment in other sectors, reduced access to EU nationals due to Brexit, and an increased demand for care staff in other organisations, including the National Health Service. Big challenges. So I must share that as we have developed, as we have accelerated delivery for Bristol to take on the opportunities and meet these challenges, we've experienced increasing opposition, resistance to change, and highlighting the downside of every intervention. The truth is that no intervention, no decision comes without risk and cost. But as Shirley Williams said, there are hazards in anything one does, but greater hazards in doing nothing. Bristol is a city of 42 square miles. We aren't getting any more land. We have a residential population of around 460,000 people, which is expected to grow to 550,000 people by 2050. The population grows to over a million people when the workforce travels in during the day. We have more than 15,000 people on our housing waiting list, with over 1,100 households in temporary accommodation. One in five of our children live in low-income households. In 2015, the Runny Me Trust ranked Bristol as the seventh worst area in England for racial inequality, and went on to say that ethnic minorities in Bristol experience greater disadvantage than in England and Wales in education and employment. While almost 100% of Clifton teenagers progress to university, it's just one in 12 in Hartcliffe. Almost 10% of our households experience fuel poverty, and 4% experience moderate to severe food insecurity. There is a gap in healthy years life expectancy of around 16 years between the richest and the poorest areas of Bristol. We need the city and, the, and public leaders to agree and hold themselves accountable to the depth and complexity of these challenges. There is no different kind of reality, only big, complex challenges. As the University of Virginia's professor Jerry Warburg said, you're entitled to your own opinions, not your own facts. We are not entitled to our own reality. Bristol leadership is a collective act, and our city's activism has been a key part of that. Our activism has been incredibly valuable, but in itself, that is not enough. In September's full council, three people made statements, each in turn. The first argued against house building on Western Slopes and, uh, and argued against urban sprawl. The second, concerned about private rents, told me to sort out the housing crisis that would require me to build homes. The third then made a statement against children living in tall buildings. And that comes against a, a broader context of a campaign against height and density in the middle of the city. Three activists, three conflicting messages, all pointing at me. I suggested in that meeting that they actually talk to each other because all three made an argument that to be solved would require compromise from the other two. It's fine to point at me, but what we need is the city to engage in a conversation. To solve the complexity of the problems in our city, we all need to work together and be on receive as well as transmit. And I've learned these lessons. In my 20s, I was all transmit. In 2000, I was protesting outside the World Bank in Washington, D.C., with a crowd, part of a protest of thousands, shouting, as it turned out, at low-paid security workers for defending neoliberalism. That was activism at its worst, more focused on the emotional gratification of the activists and their brand than the causes they claim to be fighting for. The historian and writer Paul Gilroy said, it is imperative to remain less interested in who or what we imagine ourselves to be than in what we can do for one another. At its best, activism creates the conditions for and builds the unlikely alliances that make more radical politics possible. In 1964, President Lyndon B. Johnson succeeded in bringing the Civil Rights Act into law. Martin Luther King then approached Johnson, congratulated him, and said, great, now we need a Voting Rights Act. Johnson told King he couldn't do it, 
as he cashed in all his political capital deliver, to deliver the Civil Rights Act. So King went out and organised Selma. Now, many of you would know what happened next. The marchers were brutally attacked uh, by the police, but the world was watching. And what happened on that bridge changed the political climate. It was a new climate that not only made the Voting Rights Act possible, but made it necessary. And on the 6th of August, 1965, the bill was signed by President Johnson, banning states from passing laws, prohibiting voting laws uh, based on race, uh, bringing into force what is often described as one of the most effective civil rights laws ever enacted. People sometimes say they haven't got time to waste trying to get everyone together. But I think it's also true that we haven't got time to get it wrong. We need a new political settlement in how we understand each other and how we work together. I want to talk a bit now about some of the work we've done outside of Bristol's uh, boundaries. We rarely talk about our global and our national leadership in a way that gives people a chance to engage, but it's something we should all be proud of. What happens in Bristol isn't just down to the decisions we make inside Bristol. We are shaped by national and international events. And to serve Bristol fully, we must be able to shape the context within which Bristol has to live and exert influence over those external forces that impact on life in our city. Trying to tackle city challenges without tackling this context is like straining gnats while swallowing camels. So I sit on the Mayor's Migration Council and I sit on the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Cities of Tomorrow. I mentioned it earlier, where we're doing so much of our work on international finance. I sit on the UK Cities Climate Investment Commission, where we have identified over 200 billion pounds worth of decarbonisation opportunities across the core cities and London. This year, I was asked to become chair of the Local Government Association City Regions Board. I also, sit on the, also sat on the Archbishop of Canterbury's Housing Commission, Gordon Brown's Commission on the UK's Future, on the advisory panel uh, for the Work uh, Foundation. Bristol plays a leading role in the Global Parliament of Mayors, Euro Cities and UK 100, core cities, and helped to set up the Western Gateway. That's not about boasting about any individual. All these positions we hold are, are, are team efforts that include me, my office, the wider council, and our city partners, including our universities and business uh, community. We've set up our own international strategy board in Bristol to coordinate our international activity, to mobilise city partners to represent us as a city and our interests on the global stage. And I want to share, actually, to that end, as part of that, today we can announce the appointment of three new international ambassadors uh, for the city, people who, in their, in their daily business and their travels, will go out with a mandate to represent Bristol. And I'll share with you that they are Marty Burgess, a partner at Bevan Britain and chair of Black Southwest Network, Claire Reddington, the chief executive of Watershed, and Fuad Mohammed, CEO and founder of Ashley Community Housing. And I welcome you to the role, and I know you will all promote Bristol brilliantly, joining our existing alumni of city ambassadors. I want to finish tonight also with, a, with another thanks, and that's to members of the Bristol History Commission. They've shown emotionally intelligent leadership as we've navigated an incredibly challenging time in Bristol's history following the hauling down of Colston's statue last year. They helped put together an excellent display in the M shed of the statue, received and are processing 14,000 responses to their sur uh, survey on the future of the statue and the future of how we deal with our contentious history. Their work will help us to understand our past, bring a fuller understanding of how our city has become what it is today. Now our past has been shaped by poverty and slum clearances, investment, slavery, wars, strikes, protest, chartists, suffragettes, the harbour, the docks, manufacturing, innovation and technology, migration, faith, and so much more. And within that, we have our difficulties and we have our demons. 
we have our highs and we have our heroes, including those heroes we are yet to learn about because history is not thought to tell their story. And at the same time, building on the History Commission's Bridging Histories program, our culture team is working towards a family history project that will support people right across the city, discover and understand their own personal history and why their families came here or why their families were displaced to parts of Bristol that they ended up being born in. Now I'll share personally that looking at this opportunity, I've started to look at my own family tree. And during a recent trip, which I met with many members of my uh, Jamaican family, I discovered an important part of my own history. Samuel Richardson was hung by the British. In 1865, not far from Kingston in Jamaica, in Morant Bay, a Baptist preacher called Paul Bogle led the rescue of a black man who had been arrested for trespassing on an abandoned former sugar plantation. Hundreds of people joined him as he led a call for reform. Troops were sent and spent weeks indiscriminately killing black Jamaicans. Executions followed, and among those was Samuel Richardson, my great-great-great-grandfather. And I've thought about him since finding out who he was. And I've reflected on what he would have been feeling as he took part in that rebellion, as he stood on the gallows, as he, whether he was afraid, whether he was thinking about his descendants to come, whether he even thought about his great, great, great grandson. And that discovery, that reflection has made me more me. And I want to encourage you all to join in this project as we share it with the city to uncover your own family histories. Those histories are our histories. Your histories are our histories. And those histories, when we know them, when we share them, will make us more Bristol. So I've spoken tonight about the conflicting pressures alongside the fundamental challenges, both now and in the future, and our need to deliver. To deliver at the scale and pace of change we need, we must be honest about the nature of those challenges. We must make space for alliances and bring the many with us, keeping the city together and keeping us accountable to the truth and the true nature of those challenges. We must be solutions focused. As the novelist Raymond Williams said, to be truly radical is to make hope possible rather than despair convincing. So let's choose hope. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marvin. Uh, my name's Andrew Kelly from Bristol Ideas. I'm chairing the panel session that we're going to have now to discuss uh, various issues that came up in Marvin's um, speech, but also some wider issues and what we can learn from others. We're delighted to have with us again uh, a marvelous panel. I'm gonna call them up one by one. First of all, Ian Golden, University of Oxford, and author most recently of Rescue from Global Crisis to a Better World. Just there, the friend. Sado Jurd from Black Southwest Network, the director. Mm. <laughs> Musa Okwanga, writer, broadcaster, and musician, author most recently of In the End It Was All About Love, and one of them, an Eton College memoir. Musa. and Liz Zeidler, Chief Executive of the Centre for Thriving Places. Uh, as usual, we took questions in advance from the audience. Um, we're going to feed some of those questions in, as well as some of the questions that have arisen from the uh, session tonight. I want to first of all ask the question which is probably most on people's minds, which is how do we create something better beyond COVID? How do we build back better? And I want to ask each of you in turn to comment briefly on that, but also reflect perhaps a little bit on what Marvin and our youth mayor uh, talked about. And I'll start with you, Liz. You're 
your project is about thriving places. What, what makes a thriving place in this post-COVID world? Uh, so it's a big question, isn't it? I think I, I've been pushing back a bit about this notion of building back because do we really want to build back? And I think to really thrive, we need to think about some of the lessons we've learned through COVID. And if you talk to people, you don't necessarily need to have a PhD in this to talk to people about what is it really, what have you learned through COVID? And people have learned what's important to them, what matters. And I think increasingly, and I'm very excited about this because you're seeing it in, pl in places right across the UK, increasingly places are recognizing that we mustn't build back what we had before. Because what we had before was an economic system that is designed it, at its very core to support us to consume ourselves to destruction, that wonderful poem we heard earlier. It's, it's, it's designed to create the inequalities that Marvin so eloquently talked about earlier. We need to tackle the underlying symptoms of the, of the, the underlying causes of the many, many things we're having to deal with as symptoms of COVID, that desperate levels of inequality that we're seeing in our country and the unbelievable levels of climate emergency, and it's the right word that we are facing, have the root cause in the kind of economic model we currently have. And I think the places that will thrive, and I don't just mean survive beyond, because that's what we're looking at at the moment. We're talking about survival in many ways, just physically through COVID, but um, existentially through the climate crisis. Um, the places that will thrive instead of just um, survive are the places that set, take this point in history and there's a point in history and say actually we're going to be courageous enough we're going to be brave enough to do things differently and doing things differently has it is about having an economy that says what's it all for the economy politics business etc etc what's it all for it's it's there to support us and our planet to thrive into the future. So we need to make that the end goal of, our, of all of our economic activity. And if we start at that root cause level, then all of these other things start making sense and we start having that, the right culture at the heart of it. So, so thank you, Liz. Um, Ian, you've just written a whole book about this. Well, I, I'm not gonna ask you to recite every argument, but, but some of the key points that come up about, um, about what we do next, really. Thank you, Andrew. It's, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can, yeah. It's a privilege to be here and to hear uh, the mayor's really wonderful state of the city. Um, and inspiring because you get the sense that we had a crossroads. Um, this is either going to be a time when we have deep reflection and don't bounce back or forward on the same road that's leading us over a precipice and hopefully not reset the operating system that is in because that's what's brought us the pandemic, that's what's brought us the climate emergency, that's what's brought us the inequalities we have in Bristol and everywhere else. Uh, and we need this to be the wake-up call that the Second World War was, and Bristol, through that process, found a new purpose. And my real hope is that what we're hearing from the mayor and what Bristolians will go away with is that they can make the city very different. Uh, and through that, an inspiration to the rest of the UK and the world. In the Second World War, uh, while the war was being fought, and I think we're still in the pandemic, so this isn't over this crisis, the leaders decided to create a totally different society, a welfare state. While the bombs were dropping and they were fighting on five fronts, they had the wherewithal to think about not repeating the cycle that had brought them there from the First World War to the Second World War. And they created a new international system as well, the United Nations, the Bretton Woods, the Marshall Plan. And then Churchill backed off. You know, he wouldn't embrace the welfare state, so an unknown athlete swept him out of office in the biggest landslide that Labour's ever known, uh, six weeks after he was the war hero. And that tells me two things. One is you can have the vision for change, and citizens can take power for themselves. And that's the moment I think we're in. There's a huge amount wrong, but the opportunity for change is now. Uh, and if we don't seize this, it won't come again. If we wait till a year or two or three, when we complacently go back to lives, then uh, we would have lost the momentum for change. And so this is the time to really think very deeply and act uh, on those thoughts. Thank you, Ian. You see, you live in Berlin. Uh, you've written a lot about the city. Um, what, what makes a good city for you? And, um, and, and your reflections on Marvin's speech Actually, I would like to draw in something Alice said as well, Alison Marvin, um, some themes, been in Berlin for seven years now, been in Germany for seven years too, and I would say the themes that I pull out of it that were so powerful are consultation, collaboration, and compromise. 
Compromise is often frowned upon, but it's been so effective in Berlin. So two specific examples. We had a housing referendum recently on whether um, Berlin should reclaim several thousand properties from investors who basically just came in to speculate on property. Uh, that referendum passed by almost 60%. Um, now that's extremely powerful, it's not binding, the, the current mayor, the mayor that's coming in may not actually implement that policy, but the mayor knows there is a desire from the people um, to change things and not have things as they are. Now that's extremely powerful, and Berlin's got a history of doing that. The other thing that's really important, as we've seen, we all know the rise of the far right. Um, there may be some in the audience now with far right sensibilities, I do not share them. Uh, the far right, anti-democratic, a threat to the rule of law. And the beauty of what happened in Berlin in the last four years is that people from across political spectrum who still respect the rule of law and democracy got together, you had church communities, you had nightclub communities getting together, marching, protesting, with the result that the far right vote in Berlin dropped from 14% to 7% in just four years. That was because of investigative journalism, direct action, collaboration, compromise, consultation. So important. And to have that statistic to bandy around the country, to talk to people in Germany about this, but also in Bristol, activism works. When you have shared progressive values, and I say progressive, I'm not saying you should be progressive in all aspects. I'm saying progressive in the sense of how do we move forward? How do we live together? Berlin is not perfect by any means, but in these two respects, it's been absolutely exemplary. And I hope these are lessons that are useful to Bristol. Thank you, Musa. Um, are, are we passing the microphone down? Is that no? Um, Seda, I'm coming to you next um, for your introductory comments. You, you obviously deal a lot about the future of work and good business and social justice. Well, what are your reflections on, on this so far? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I yeah. can. I think in terms of reflection um, on Marvin's speech, how do I follow that up? Um, it was incredibly powerful um, in terms of setting the case uh, and really powerfully reflecting around the inequality um, that perhaps we all saw um, through the pandemic. Having worked in racial justice for the last uh, 10, 15 years, if I'm being honest, at the beginning of uh, the crisis, I could have easily predicted uh, the disproportional impact that will emerge out of it because that was the reality uh, in terms of data if you had to look at racial inequality across all the policy areas. So to actually see black and minority, ethnic communities, the poorest, uh, disabled people being disproportionately impacted I don't think it was a surprise. I think it was a surprise to a lot of people. Uh, for most of us working in that space, not at all. And I think we're still living through that. I hear the notion around, and I totally agree with Liz, around the notion around build, building back better, but building from what? I think that is the key question. And it's exactly true. If we're building from what we had, um, it is a broken system, but I would actually argue, not necessarily, because it works for a lot of people. The people who are benefiting from the system, and the system works for them. Um, if you look at the richest list of billionaires uh, from Sunday Times, there were 20 billionaires added through the crisis. Um, if you're middle class and professional, you made a lot of money out of savings uh, because you worked comfortably from your house. So I don't think the system is broken. I think the system is okay for a lot of people, but it doesn't for most. Now the key question is, are we bold enough to change that? Um, brutally honest, I don't think so. I think even coming out, I hear the notion about building back better, but we're pretty much going back to that. We're very quick. So I guess reflecting on Bristol, um, I think in terms of Bristol, we've kind of moved forward, and I feel proud of Bristol. And that is the leadership that exists in Bristol, and Marvin has clearly articulated that, and he's done that consistently, not shying away from the injustice and the inequality that we have. But I don't think it will rely on the local authority or the leadership of the mayor to solve the challenges that we have in the city. I think it needs all of us collectively to actually understand, accept that yes, we have a broken system, but we can also reimagine 
to build something that is different, something that is viable. And if there's a place that I think can do that, I genuinely think Bristol can do that. But we need, I'm an activist, but I also agree with your challenge uh, coming up with solutions. But I trust that we can do that, but we just need to be brutally honest. Uh, we need to be brave. Um, and at some point, we will have to accept that to achieve equity, some of us will have to give up something. And that is the absolute reality. Until we get to that point, I don't think we can realize what we're talking about. And I'll shut up. I don't want to be too pessimistic. Oh, thank you, Sayed. <laughs> Marvin, we've heard a lot about people having to give up things, about the problems with our institutions, where things work, and so on. What, what stops you, apart from hard cash, what stops you delivering? a lot of the things you want to have happen. Hard cash. <laughs> I know it's part from hard cash, yeah. <laughs> that, that's You've made it. it very clear tonight, the money you need. So. It's it. I, 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 um, we, we had a, someone brought a comment to full council recently in, about climate, and the point I made was that it's not about T-shirts and banners, it's about cash and project plans, right? What's missing in COP, and I, and I will share this as a point of concern for me, uh, we've had two years to get ready for this, right? The climate strategy was launched yesterday. There's been not one conversation with the UK core cities, right? Well, these are the 10 biggest cities outside London. You add London to that. If you want to decarbonize the UK economy, decarbonize our city economies. There has been no conversation. So we're finding out about the government's climate strategy yesterday with everyone else. When actually what should have happened, we should have sat around, you could have convened us easily, myself, Nick Forbes, from Newcastle, Hugh Thomas, Richard Lees in, in Manchester, we'd have come and sat around, we'd have said, this is what it takes to carbonise our city, we'd have done all the pre-work with our universities and so forth, we'd have sat around and say with the government, we could have laid out the project plan and the timeline for decarbonisation, that we could have had a conversation, but by the time they got to COP, they could have announced a decarbonisation of UK cities. And I'll say why it's, it's even less forgivable that that didn't happen, and I'm not saying it's about me, I'm really not, but I did participate in an all-party parliamentary group last year on COP about subnational actors. Caroline Lucas was on the call, Kerry McCarthy came, and the point I made was government should make the next COP about cities and put cities at the centre and have, a, and have worked up a global strategy to decarbonise the world's cities. Right? We'd be in an incredible space right now. That didn't happen, and, and it's, a, it's a broken mindset that thinks that all the solutions to the world problems are in nation's capitals, right? And, and they're just not. So you're seeing more and more city assertion. Obviously, that's limited because of finance. But that's why the work we've done with the World Economic Forum and this UK Cities uh, uh, Climate Investment Commission is so important. So with Greg Clark, not the politician, UK Cities Catapult and you know, HSBC financier, that's why we have proactively done our own work to identify, it's 200 plus, but it goes up to about 300 billion pounds worth of decarbonization, and I want to call them opportunities, not costs. 350 quid's worth of opportunity, at 350 billion pounds worth, not 350 quid. <laughs> decarbonization opportunities across the UK core cities. We're taking that to COP uh, in, in a couple of weeks, and, and we'll be talking not just to government, by the way, we're talking to private sector. So, so Greg will say that HSBC has earmarked a trillion dollars for decarbonisation. Their challenge is, how can we spend it? They can't land it because of all sorts of challenges about scale and the ability of places to get their, their opportunities market ready. That's, again, that's a challenge about finance. You can pay 1,500 quid a day for a consultant that will get you a billion pound project ready. That's how much they cost. But when you start talking about taking those consultants on, people get annoyed about it. <laughs> but that's the pathway there. So it's a challenge for us. And Ian, you've written a lot recently about cities and the importance of cities in this. Tell us a little bit more about that, your argument there. Well, as uh, the mayor indicated, uh, the future's in cities. Uh, fortunately, city mayors tend to be much more forward-thinking than many national politicians often. Um, they don't have the purse strings they need. And the pandemic uh, is challenging. The, the cities in very deep ways, not only because it's increased all the inequalities, uh, but also 
people, the rich people are fleeing cities uh, in some cases. So places like New York, London and so on are suffering severely and public transport systems are under pressure. My own view is that we need much more devolution to cities. Uh, we need much more power vested and income vested uh, at the city level and that we should give cities the potential uh, to do what they can do best, which is decarbonize our economies and, of course, create jobs. There's huge potential. Uh, there's also a lot of cities, and I don't think Bristol's uh, on the front line of this, because the growth of people around the world is in coastal cities, uh, they're going to be hugely vulnerable to climate change as well. Tidal surges, salination, intrusion into waters, systems, uh, floods, and by the end of the century, we're going to have a meter or more ocean rise. Uh, so that is going to pose a massive question. The only solution is going to be a massive increase in investment. And go back to where's the money going to come from? It's going to have to come uh, from taxation systems at the f national level. Uh, cities generate the wealth, but they don't keep it. Uh, that gets taxed nationally. And that's the, that's the challenge, is to allow cities to keep more of the wealth they generate. Take us on to um, questions we had about inequality, and I'll ask each of the panel members to comment on this. First, Muster, you, you, I wonder how many people in this audience went to Eton. Um, did anybody go to Eton? Put your hand up. Muster, you went to Eton. <laughs> um, you've seen that kind of education. What, what makes a, uh, how, how would you say that we should have solved some of the inequalities in education through the, the education that you had? My concern with the class system in the UK at the moment is you have a vast amount of influence held by an increasingly vanishingly small proportion of the population. That is bad for so many reasons, uh, a lack of vision, a lack of forward-thinking perspectives. It's what Donald Rumsfeld, you know, who has many problems, the only time I ever quote him approvingly was when he talked to the unknown unknowns. And the big problem with that is when you don't know the things you don't know. And that is the biggest problem, the single biggest problem, the fatal problem of the private school system. You can, you can talk about hearts and minds as much as you like, but it remains a lasting shame of the Conservative Party. The first time that Ian Duncan Smith fully engaged with the issue of poverty was when he had left office as the leader of his party. He ran for the office of Prime Minister without actually understanding the poverty of the people. That to me is terrible. And my fear with the class system as it currently is, there are too many people in the UK who revere power for the sake of power. This is the primary problem. Now again, I'm in Germany, Germany is not perfect by any means, but in a country where the class system is not so much of a problem, so much of a veruca on the body politic of English politics, you have a society where housing is still affordable in the capital, where renters are protected, and the basis of a happy life in so many cities is simply affordable housing. As you talked of hard cash, so I speak of housing. And the private school system and the, uh, the way it clutches opportunity to itself and funnels opportunities to the richest is a problem that will only grow over time. It's got worse since I was at that school. It will get worse in the years to come if we don't do something about it. And Liz, you in the Centre for Thriving Places have your own index about what makes a thriving place. What, what about issues of inequality within that? What, what, are, what are your indices on that? So when we developed it, we were very, very careful to make sure that we were saying, you know, what are the, what are the things that help to support a place to thrive at a local level? So what are the conditions? How do we create the conditions for people to thrive? But really importantly, how do we do that equitably so that you're not just improving the lives of a few people, which is what happens in far too many places? And how do you do it sustainably so future generations can also thrive? But I think when we're talking about inequality, we've got this, there's two elements. One is that systemic thing that I think pretty much all of us have talked about. The system itself is designed to make a few people, as we heard, billionaires, get richer and richer, and, and to divide and conquer the rest of us. It is absolutely designed for that, system, for that end and for us to consume too much. So there's a huge systemic challenge, which I, I think can be really disarming, but I do think cities have got an extraordinary opportunity, and Bristol is very, very much at, the, at, the, at a point in the history where it could do this, where you have to make that kind of culture change, where you say, actually, the, we know we need more money, we know we need more power, we need all of those things, but we can't wait for all of those things to be handed to us. So we will ourselves decide that we will collectively say these are our priorities. Equality is our priority, climate change is our priority. We will put those things first. We will not put en en you know, endless amounts of growing GDP first. And I think part of that is 
um, this is going to sound a bit pedantic, but part of that is language, because language is unbelievably powerful. So we talk about things like inclusive growth. What the hell are we thinking of any kind of growth? That is, you know, why do we need that prefix on it? Why do we need the prefix of social value? Value is, is about something that matters to us. And if it doesn't matter to, to society and to the planet, what the hell are we talking about it having any value? Even things like affordable housing. I mean, the idea that we, we have a world where housing is completely unaffordable <laughs> is, you know, if we stop and think about the language that we use, I think it's, it's really important that even, even, you know, with all due respect, the, the, the title of today's event was about, you know, Bris Bristol's ambition to be a tolerant city. You know, when you talk to your children, you don't want them to be tolerant of other people. You want them to be embracing of it. Tolerance is the first step, and it's an important first step. I recognize that. We want to get, we need bigger ambition than that. We want to get way past tolerating each other and starting to really appreciate, respecting, and valuing the incredible luck we have to live in such a diverse city and the opportunities that gives us on every possible level. I don't want my kids or anyone else's kids to learn to have an ambition to tolerate other people. I want them to get beyond that. So I think we need to start reclaiming that language and putting that at the front and center of our ambitions as individuals, as communities, but also as cities, and show the rest of them the way, show national governments the way, show, show those people who are being blind to the opportunities that the current crisis has given us um, how a different world is possible. Hope, Marvin said it at the end, you know, we need to move there. And Sada, not, notwithstanding the use of the prefix, of inclusive Sorry. growth. No, that's fine. I'm, I'm not very good at choosing titles. That's my problem. <laughs> um, but inclusive growth is really critical for your work, isn't it, Sado? Um, yeah, but before I just come to the point of inclusive growth, I just want to pick up around the education because I think that is fundamentally important. I genuinely think if you think about what is happening in London um, and the changes that have happened in education, especially in a city in London, is significant and huge. And the reason for that is because of leadership and intentionality uh, in London to actually fix the education system. For the first time you have a school in Newham that actually sent more kids to Oxford and Cambridge than Eton. So it is possible, it's not about um, inner city or anything, but it's about being deeply intentional, it's about investment, and it's about teaching. And if we just did that in our education system, then we can achieve that. So I just wanted to add that around education because it is happening in London and it is possible. I think coming back to inclusive economic growth, uh, personally from an organizational perspective, um, it just started from a place where I thought, most of the issues that we were talking about, whether we're talking about criminal justice or uh, all the issues, they were really stemming from a place of pretty much economic inequality. And that is a key issue. And how do you begin to understand that, but from a community perspective? And I think personally for me, it was just about frustration um, and just getting tired of just being around tables and telling people that they needed to do things differently. Um, and I think it was just going back and saying, and we did a piece of research with entrepreneurs, and I could see the level of talent and ambition that existed in the community, um, and just started from that place. But what do we actually need to help these entrepreneurs uh, to get to the place that they wanted to get to? What do we need to do? And I think that pretty much defined our work. Um, and I can honestly say we had a program around um, we did in partnership through the pandemic with NatWest, and they wanted to do uh, something around enterprise, and it was in the middle of the pandemic. And I wasn't really sure or convinced, but I went along, and then I said, okay, let's test this. Uh, and that was digitally online, and it was aimed at women. And we had 26 women in the midst of the pandemic signing up to the program. And when we had the women, and Asha came to that, um, I was blown away by the talent and they worked through and they developed the businesses. So I guess what I'm saying and seeing in the city, there is so much potential, um, but sometimes that potential is not seen uh, because a lot of people don't really understand and people who are making decisions. And I think we need to move away from that, but I also feel from the space that we're in, we need to think radically how do we also build the infrastructure within communities to develop a different kind and drive a different kind of economic growth 
uh, that is more secular, that is more within communities, that I think in the long term can be both environmental and economic. And I think that lies within community, whether it's asset ownership, um, different kind of economic growth. So it's not just top down, but it also has to come from bottom up. Thank, thank you. Marvin, I want to um, bring you in, in. One of the questions we had was about the, the, the actual role of the mayor um, itself. And I want to put it in the context of you know, when the system was set up, the kind of powers you were allocated were fairly limited. Well, you weren't, but the mayoral system. What kind of powers do you really want as mayor um, that, you could, uh, that could, you could help deliver what you want? I want all power. <laughs> and of course I'm joking, right? I mean, tweeting that, someone would tweet it. And, uh, uh, no. <laughs> to be honest, I, you know, we ask this, what more powers do we want through devolution, right? I think one of, the, one of the most powerful things we can get, irrespective of before you start switching power around, is long-term predictable finance, right? It's the last-minute announcements. Here's a funding pot here. This is the way national funding works. So it doesn't allow you to plan. If we could plan, right? If I could, if Bristol City Council could plan and say, look, everybody, this is the next 10 year financial journey we're going to be on. This is where we're going to be investing. Then actually unlocks a lot of things. It means that the universities could plan, housing developers could plan, police could plan, health service could plan, because we become a much more stable local partner. We become more predictable. So as I shared with you, we've looked at our numbers now coming out of the ether with COVID and everything, we so, you know, it's not suddenly, we knew it was gonna come, but now we face this massive funding uh, challenge. That brings instability to us, that echoes out into the wider uh, city. So, but if we could come to a way of doing uh, local government finance that was certain, predictable, stable, um, there's a lot of untapped uh, power locally, and I mean place-based power, not local government power, that, that would then be Unleash. People would have confidence to take more risks because they know where we were going to be in, in three, five years. And as they begin to take risks and plan and leverage their own resources, good things happen uh, for the place. I, I, I must say so much comes down to money. If I can just say just really quickly, the current model of funding is often uh, like this. Government will say, we're announcing this pot of money, right? Fight for it. That's literally how it works. So then we get our local, we get our officers. Cardiff will get, well, they're Wales, but say Plymouth will get theirs, Manchester will get theirs, and we'll all go on a beauty parade trying to get this money. It's zero sum. Some get it, some don't. So you've put lots of hours into the application, you lost, that's a, this kind of waste of time. Maybe get it next year. That literally happened around feeding hungry kids a couple of years ago. We have a fantastic structure to feed kids in the city. Um, with feeding Bristol, food banks, ourselves. Um, government put a few million quid on the table. We got nothing. Plymouth got the money. Now, our point is, we don't want to succeed because Plymouth lost. We don't want Plymouth to, we, we, you know, that's not what we wanted. But we still have hungry kids, and so no national government money came to support hungry kids. Amazingly, what happened in Bristol is that the business community stepped up. So we put some money in the pot, Andy Street, we convened down Burgess Salmon business set up. We put 125,000 pounds on the table from ourselves and about 60,000 meals went out to hungry kids a couple of summers ago. So we, we've done our own thing, but we could have done so much more with, with proper government support. And, and Ian, one of the key lessons I took from your recent book was the importance of that kind of long-term thinking and planning, even in the midst of a, a world war really. And you know, we're coming out of this, well, hopefully we're coming out of this crisis, but are we doing that long-term planning now? No, I think the, you know, the, the business world is very driven by quarterly reports, by shareholder pressures, um, by the stock markets, and they are becoming more and more short-term, and you see this in the life of CEOs, which are shorter and shorter. Uh, so they're not making the long-term investments, and one of the reasons we have these supply chain crises that we're seeing at the moment is because people are just kicking it down the road. This just-in-time, uh, mentality where anything that's spare capacity, whether it's a spare person or whether it's a spare part, whether it's something in a warehouse, whether it's a spare supplier, uh, where that's regarded as a bad thing in the MBAs and the business practices uh, is part of the problem. We should be regarding spare capacity, the ability to absorb shocks, to bounce back uh, as a great strength. 
but it's regarded as a great weakness uh, in terms of accounting practices, this spare. So th that's a problem in, in the private sector, in the public sector, the politicians, and I think driven by the Twitter feeds and driven by social media, are becoming more and more short term. And the institutions we used to have for the long term, like civil service, used to be across governments, and in Europe, there was very strong civil service in Brussels and the Commissariat de Plan in, in France and so on. Those have all been dismantled effectively, and then now that you know, civil service still exists, but the spads above it, the political advisors above it, are just making these civil servants uh, do short term things. So uh, the system has become more and more short term, and that, that's why we see the crisis. You know, less money is spent on pandemic prevention than is spent on one major hospital or one major frigate in the Navy. Uh, when any intelligence agency will tell you that the risk to all of our lives is thousands of times greater from a pandemic than it is from a war. But we spend you know, 20,000 times more on war. Why? Uh, because we're looking in a rearview mirror and because that's what's politically uh, the game. Uh, so no, short-termism short is a major problem. And cities, and, you know, I think the mayor's just illustrated this problem, are uh, incapacitated in, the, in their capacity, and we, we really need to change that uh, for the better. And, and you, so from the perspective of Berlin and how that city runs itself, do, do they think in the longer term? <laughs> I mean, German bureaucracy is a myth. <laughs> <laughs> I think I felt like Berlin was created to destroy that myth of German bureaucracy being successful. But um, what I will say is this. Um, when looking at what we need to do to move forward as a city in Berlin, as a country in Germany, I always think we need to do the opposite of what rich people are doing. So if rich people are blasting off into space and ignoring the rest of the people, we need to get hyper-local. And one of the most impressive things that Germany did, that Berlin did, was um, providing a vaccine to homeless people, providing Johnson & Johnson single-shot vaccine to homeless people. It's care for the homeless and it can do things better, but I think the one thing the city does so well is that kind of planning in terms of housing. We won't say affordable housing, we say joyful housing. Berlin is quite good at providing, I mean, it's got a housing crisis at the moment. One thing it's done quite well, I think, compared to most European cities is protecting the long-term renting rights of people in property so they can plan their family life, there's autonomy. It's really quite good with um, childcare, healthcare, really good benefit systems there. Again, the long-term planning that Marvin's talking about. So you can look at your family and say, well, actually, you know, 10, 15 years from now, I can be living like this. And, and you can actually plan your living. And I think the problem with with London in particular, I hope Bristol hasn't fallen foul of that, is the costs are so horrifying. The cost of living, even if you've got a mortgage you can afford, just you know, the transport is £21 now for my mum's house. Ten years ago it was £5. You know, so I think the Berlin lift, for all its challenges, has got the kind of the long-term basics pretty well, if not under control, then at least no negotiable in the medium to long term. We are running out of time, I'm afraid, but I'm going to run it on till quarter past nine because we started slightly late. I want to ask both Sado and, and Liz a question about just transition and how we move forward in that way. Um, Liz, can I start with you? Oh, that's a big old question, isn't it? Um, I'd like to put a tiny proviso on the fact that I now look like I don't believe in inclusive growth or affordable housing. <laughs> I massively do, of course. What I'm saying is that those are stepping stones to something else. And I, perhaps that is a good lead in to the, the notion of a transition. I think we do need a transition, but I think we need a very urgent transition. So transition seems like we've got plenty of time. Uh, I'm a huge, huge fan of very courageous leadership that says this is the direction of travel, hence the language thing. Like, let's, let's aim big and then start moving as fast as we can towards it. And I think, so, the, so, so the, in many of you have probably heard, in Wales they, have, they passed this piece of legislation called the Future Generations Act, which basically put into law, well, sort of legislative space, the idea that every bit of public money had to think about and justify its, its existence based on the, the capacity for it to improve the well-being of current and future generations. It's quite a small, comparatively, piece of language in law, but actually a hugely powerful thing to do, to say, you know, you can't spend public money unless you're thinking about the well-being of future generations. And so I think that transition is partly about doing things that actually, if you talk to the people, and I've very good relationships with the people who set that in motion, and they say, we didn't actually really know what we, what, what, what we were doing, we didn't know how to deliver this, but actually by putting it out there, by putting out there that this is our aim, 
it had a, this sort of cultural change effect throughout the whole system, that people had to start thinking long term, they had to start thinking about not just tomorrow, you know, whether or not they had the funding for it, it caused lots of problems, but it's also, I think, really changed hearts and minds in the system across that country. And I think a lot of the powerful changes we're seeing in other countries, you know, in New Zealand, when Jacinda Ahern just said, you know what, we're this, you know, we might be out of sync with the rest of the world, but we're, we are setting forth our budget that is a well-being budget, and the money is spent when it is, can show that it will improve people's lives now and in the future. And it's that kind of bold, this is where we're going. We don't care whether that's politically trendy. There's a lot less ego about it. It's compromise. I loved that word right at the beginning. Let's, you know, it's, it's, it, let's, let's put it out there and then start getting there. So I think the justness of the transition needs to be about us collectively genuinely putting forward some very ambitious goals and then collectively getting behind it, whatever our colour, our background, our class or anything else. Um, so I think, you know, the just transition requires us all to be leaders. We can't, I really agree it's very easy to stand around waving a finger at, at Marvin, whether you're a councillor or anybody else. Of course, I'm sure I've waved my, the odd finger at Marvin, if we're honest. But, uh, you know, of course that's an easy step to take, but every single person in this room needs to be the leader that says, in my business, in my family, in my community, this is where we're going and let's try and support each other to get there. So I think the transition is, needs to be urgent and brave. Sado, just transition. Yeah, I think that's well said. I'm not sure what to add to that. Um, the key question is, I always feel, I get nervous when business jumps in, uh, which is happening now. Um, and the reason for that is, then it becomes highly commercialized. And I think we're beginning with that conversation. And I don't see a lot of conversation around especially uh, engagement with civil society organizations or communities at this point of design and development, uh, which is always the case. Uh, and if that happens, then the whole notion and the things that we're talking about around just fair, inclusive, just becomes an addition uh, somewhere at the end that we're trying to fix. And I think that's happening already. Uh, so the key is how do we meaningfully engage people? And part of that will be to achieve just transition, will again be very much based on deeply understanding uh, inequality and injustice that's really built within our system. Um, and make sure that um, communities, and especially people who will be impacted the most, are not again left behind and we're trying to fix this five years, 10 years, down the line when we're actually in the midst of a crisis. So that engagement would be crucial, but I'm not seeing that yet. Now, at the end of um, Marvin's speech, he quoted Raymond Williams, which was rather apt because it's the 100th anniversary, Raymond Williams' birth this year. And he said, um, to be truly radical is to make hope possible rather than despair convincing. And I want to ask each of the panel members to tell us how we make hope possible rather than despair convincing, uh, sorry, uh, convincing, um, but I'm going to give them a little bit of time to think about it. I've got one question for you, Marvin, which is, have you thought about replicating the work that Liz talked about in Wales with the Future Generations Commission? It's something that we've been looking at a lot. Sophie Howe, the commissioner, has spoken a number of times in Bristol. Is this something that you think might be a good way of looking at uh, the futures for, for a city like Bristol? It's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I used to work in public health, but, you know, and as Liz knows as well, as in the public mental health team, which is actually where some of that talk came from today, you know, that, that our health outcomes are political products in many ways, you know. It's not that's down to health services, it's a product of our economic political system. Um, so we'd be more than up in that name for population health doing so. There is a structure through which we've tried to, to build to make sure that there's a channel for those ideas to, to, to come into what we set out for Bristol, and that's the city office and the one city plan. That's like saying it's not a city council plan, it's a space that we hope people can join all the thematic boards and drive ideas in so that we collectively agree what we want to be in 2050. Um, that, that, I mean, the statement for Bristol is to be in 2050 a city of hope. Yeah, that, that wasn't my words, those were words that came from conversations with the city. Um, so I, I think there's, there's every way. I'd be, it'd be interested to get some more on, on the background of it to see how it's practically applied. Uh, we can certainly provide that, I think, on the Future Generations Commission. And right, what makes um, hope 
possible rather than despair convincing. Uh, Ian. There's so many reasons to be cheerful and hopeful. I mean, the vaccines being done in nine months, where it took 10 years before, uh, the fact that I think we were vaccinated in the room, um, and that we see these incredible acts of solidarity, the nurses, the doctors, the care workers that go and put themselves on the line every time they're working into work, and so many other essential workers. That makes me hopeful. What makes me hopeful too is that governments are doing things now that would have been unimaginable in January uh, 2020. <laughs> Conservatives putting a third of workers on, on furlough, uh, telling firms they can't go bankrupt because it's in the national interest. That makes me hopeful. Uh, <laughs> what doesn't make me hopeful is that they reverse the universal credit. What makes me hopeful too is that when I think of the alternative, which is going back to business as usual, I get really, really scared. You know, we're, we're going to have another pandemic. We're going to have escalating climate change and things. So, although change seems scary, it's far less scary and much more optimistic than staying as you are, because when you stay as you are, you're condemned. Uh, but if you can change, if you can move, if you can do things differently, you create a new world and a new life for yourself and for others around you. So all of those things make me uh, helpful. They've been incredible experiences that I think we've all had in the pandemic, which have changed our lives, made us think in different ways uh, about ourselves, about nature, about our families, our loved ones, the communities. And if we can take that forward, uh, there are lots of reasons to be cheerful. And Liz? I think, you know, we, uh, we set up the Centre for Thriving Places sort of 12 years ago and chose to do this work in places because we thought that's where the change would happen. And my hope comes from the fact we're now, 12 years later, starting to see exactly that happen. You know, places around the country are t t sitting there trying to write an economic recovery plan and going, hang on a minute, I don't want to write the same economic recovery plan I've written for the last how many years. I want to do this differently. How do we do this differently? And we're seeing that, you know, people getting on the phone and saying, you know, we thought we had to start with a blank piece of paper, but actually you've done an awful lot of the work for us. How do we do this? And we're not alone in that. You know, there's an amazing organization called the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, which is very handily called We All, which is a very nice uh, catch-all. But, you know, the, they, they are getting people from all over the world, you know, c cities, regions, countries, coming forward and saying, we want to switch to an economy that is based on delivering for people and planet. And that was just such a distant dream 12 years ago. And I completely agree with Ian that suddenly we've realised that what seemed impossible even two years ago is now possible. So the combination of the fact that we know that we can do extraordinary things almost overnight in some cases you know the idea of the things we've managed to do last year is extraordinary um, the combination of that and this kind of I think a real mo moment of realization around the world that we need a different type of economy and that places you know we weren't wrong 12 years ago places and cities are taking the lead and have this opportunity I'm, I'm really I'm genuinely hopeful I'm terrified aren't we all because we're in an extraordinary point in history but I'm really really hopeful Sada? So I, I can sound pretty pessimistic, uh, but I'm actually an eternal optimist uh, because you need that if you work in racial justice, um, there isn't an, an, another option. I think there's so much change that's happened uh, that gives me hope um, in, in the city. I've seen so much and I've worked in the city and I've seen so much change. Um, I work with people on a daily basis um, and I see the drive, the ingenuity, and the passion at the community level. Um, so there's so much uh, to actually say a different reality is possible. Um, and I think that's what gives me hope. I think we just have to push ourselves, believe that things can be different. Um, and I think the ingredient for that is optimism and hope. You can do that any differently. Thank you. And Musa? Yeah, I think uh, so much. Germans have a kind of a thick vein of pessimism that passed through societies. When the results came out for the election, there was a lot of despondency. And I said to them, hang on a minute. If someone had said to you that, if someone had said to you in mid-2017 that they would mobilise ten times as many people for anti-fascist marches as fascist marches on the streets of Berlin, you'd have said, no way. If someone had said to you that in one of the most 
frankly, racist regions of the country where the far right is a real, real problem, a local politician on a progressive platform would defeat one of the highest profile far right conspiracy theorist politicians in a head to head poll. You'd have said no way at all. But what happened was good people from across the political spectrum that respected the rule of law and democracy and autonomy and empathy and compassion really fought back. That all happened. And the reason they did it is to Liz's point it was the language, right? They weren't an anti fascist protest, they were a love march, a love parade. When the, anti when the fascists were marching outside the Reichstag, people got together and said, actually, we represent love. We represent indivisibility and common purpose. And the reason why I feel hopeful is because this terrifying political moment has forced people to evaluate what truly matters across the spectrum, political, across the spectrum, regardless of wealth, color, sexuality, identity. It's forced people to look at what identity politics was always meant to be. Politics as it was informed by experience and the experience of others. And that empathy, which I've seen in action in Germany the last four years, is incredibly inspiring. And that's why I'm hopeful and that's why I'm here. And some good messages of hope there, Marvin. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, I like hope. I, I have made, often shared my distinction between being hopeful and optimistic. And it's one that, I think, if I'm not butchering it, Desmond Tutu made. Not being an optimist, I, find, I sometimes find optimism quite a, a kind of a political phrase. Uh, but hope, there's a, there's a passage I've used a lot, right? We don't despise our sufferings because suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. And I like hope because actually it reckons with the fact that there is suffering in life. Um, but if we can, and actually in many ways, we all know that suffering can be the source of character. <laughs> um, and that is where, you know, where our hope is, that we, we prove our, our perseverance. So uh, that's why, that's one of the reasons we, we, you know, we've kind of fallen in love with the, the term for Bristol. Well, thank you very much. We are out of time. I want to give some thanks before I thank the panel. First of all, um, huge thanks to our two signers tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs> Secondly, thank you to the University of Bristol. It is quite moving actually, having organized hundreds and hundreds of events over the years and then done no live events for nearly 19 months to see a live audience back. And although we are making our way slowly and we can't have full capacity yet, it has been fantastic to see you all here tonight and thank you very much for coming. Um, thirdly, to Hugh Brady for introducing the evening, to Alice, uh, the youth mayor, for her visionary presentation and to Caleb, the city poet, and thank you, Caleb, for your collection of poems, which is a, which is a fantastic uh, book. Um, I should add that if you want to know more about the work, uh, particularly of Ian and Musa, we have conducted a lengthier interview with both of them about their work, and that's available on the Festival of I uh, the Bristol Ideas website, our Crowdcast platform. Uh, Ian's we did a few months ago, and Musa's we actually did last night. And we go into great detail there in terms of the work they're doing. And I also encourage you to read their work. And if you go down to Watershed tomorrow, um, we do have our friends at Waterstones who have a fully stocked bookshop there with the work of the authors. Thank you very much, Marvin. Thank you very much, uh, Sado, Ian, Musa, Liz. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, and do attend other Festival of the Future City events, which are running tomorrow and actually into the months to come. Thank you very much. Thank you.